So um, I was invited here to, to speak about uh, the social history of dying, but uh, Patrick asked me to broaden the topic. So I have. I've, uh, we're going to talk about death, dying, and bereavement. I've spent the last 25 years studying dying. Um, I'm fond of saying that uh, it, I don't really study death. In fact, when you stop moving, I lose interest. I'm, <laughs> I'm primarily someone who's interested in the, beh the behavior, if you like, of people in the last minutes, hours, days, weeks of life. And I've spent uh, some 25 years uh, interviewing um, people with short life expectancies and spending time uh, with them and observing them and talking to them, both uh, as my career moved on in a research capacity, but also in a pastoral capacity as well. Today, um, I have about 30 minutes to cover about 2 million years and most human cultures. So you'll forgive me if I run roughshod over the, some of the detail. And I'm sure that in the 20 minutes that we have for questions, that um, please feel free to ask me about some of the exceptions, or you might have a, a story or an anecdote you'd wish to put up to challenge some of the things that I'm talking about here today. But what I've decided to do is try to pull out a dozen or so of the demographic and epidemiological and social characteristics of death, dying, and bereavement, which most researchers in the world pretty much agree on. So they're the, basically the stable things that you can say about death and dying. So what's the first one? Well, the first one are causes of death. The major causes of death for most of human history, now bear in mind that for most of human history were hunter-gatherers, hunter-gatherers, foragers. If we didn't actually um, go looking to dig up roots and pick berries, we would try to spear animals, and if spearing animals was too scary, we often held back until after the tigers and the leopards and things like that had finished with the carcass, and then we'd go in after the more timid ones of us. Trauma was the major cause of death, dying in childbirth, um, but also predation. You have to remember that um, in the, the first period, uh, in, the, in the growth of Homo sapiens, if you like, um, was something that uh, was a period of evolved development, if you like. And Australopithecines is considered one of the forerunners, a bipedal ape um, that stood upright and preceded uh, Homo, ne Homo ne neanderthalensis and Homo erectus and then Homo sapiens. I'm sure many of you know some of that history. And I guess emblematic of the trauma, when we found an Australopithecine uh, skull of a child, it's one of the first Australopithecine findings, that skull had a claw mark embedded in it, where a bird had obviously swept down and taken it. Um, Homo neanderthalensis, or Neanderthal man, if you x-ray um, and examine uh, many of the Neanderthal man's bones, you'll find that it looks just like a professional rodeo rider. It was very unusual for a Neanderthal man to reach the age of 13, 14 years of age without having broken several bones. They were close in hunters and often paid the price of that. Um, about 10, 12,000 years ago, we started farming. We became gardeners. And the problem with that is we stopped moving around. The first thing that happens when you stop moving around is that you stand in your own sewerage. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. <laughs> it's something to dwell on before going to sleep at night. <laughs> 12,000 years, 10,000 years, we stopped moving around, started having gardens, started to keep animals and stand in our own sewerage. Now, those two things contributed to the rise of infectious diseases. Bird flu, which we're so paranoid about in the last few years, of course, is a very old problem. Chicken pox is one of the first few bird flus. One of the things about cohabiting with animals is that we end up getting the bacteria and the viruses from those animals into human populations. And recently, of course, with longer life expectancies, the main way in which we die are through chronic diseases. That's cardiovascular systems diseases, heart attacks and strokes, Cancers, of course, respiratory diseases. These are things which 
don't take minutes or hours or indeed weeks. They sometimes take years to kill you. Life expectancy. In prehistory, again for about two million years, the life expectancy of most transitional hominids, Australopithecines, Neanderthal man, Erectus, Homo sapiens, was mainly in the teens. When we first discovered Neanderthal man in a French cave, there was a lot of excitement, if uh, you remember, those of you who are old enough to remember. But Neanderthal man was a boy of 17. And that was about right for Neanderthal man. The life expectancy of transitional hominids was roughly the same as the life expectancy of most primates. In pre-industrial period, we ended up living around the 20s, early 20s. Uh, the middle classes, they lived to in their early 30s, sometimes their early 40s. So Jesus Christ, for example, died at the age of 33, son of a carpenter, petty bourgeois. He died roughly on time. Pity about the cause of death, but apart from that, <laughs> people that have... Uh, Seen Armadeus, the uh, film about Mozart, he also died around 33. Again, pity about the cause of death, but by and large, he lived about the right time. An industrial period, of course, we now live well into our 70s and 80s, and that will soon go up into the 90s in places like the United States and Japan and Britain. And I think one of the dramatizations, if you like, about life expectancy is to recall that when the church churches in the, in the medieval period used to say uh, at wedding ceremonies, this union will stay together till death do you part. Easy. <laughs> you get married at the age of 12 or 13, you die around 21. Marriage is roughly, what, seven, eight years? You'd have to be a weakling not to cope with that. It's a waiting game, even if you made a mistake. <laughs> now, of course, if you marry in your 20s, your marriage can expect to be 50, 60 years. I mean, you'd, you'd have to be a hero, wouldn't you? To... <laughs> Divorce rates roughly 50% in the United States, sometimes 30%, 30 to 50%. Little wonder it's not more. <coughs> Who dies? The main people who die for most of human history are infants. Perinatal mortality within hours, um, sometimes days, is very common. And in pre-industrial times, that was mainly infants again, but also children. So children would often die around three, four, and five years of age. And one of the reasons why people everywhere, traditional peoples, had a lot of children is hopefully that some of them would end up surviving. Um, the scattergun effect. Um, you can imagine that also in Europe, there was a practice uh, in large parts of Europe where people did not name children until they were three, four, and even five years of age because it really wasn't worth it. Um, if they could survive to three and four, five years of age, they then quickly dressed them as adults and gave them a name. And the reason why they dressed them as adults, and you'll see this in a lot of medieval painting, when you go around art galleries in Europe, you'll see children dressed as little adults, and you wonder why that is the case. It's because there was a widespread belief that death had a taste for children. So if you dressed them as adults, the angel of death would pass by. You could trick death. Death was vicious, but not apparently too bright. <laughs> then, of course, you have um, the industrial uh, times, which is today, the contemporary time, where the main people who die are the elderly, Three quarters of the people who die every year are over the age of 65 in places like the United States and um, Japan and Britain and Australia and Canada and so forth. And if you have to also understand, if you're talking about death and dying globally, then you have to understand that the bulk of the people who die every year uh, die in poverty. So the bulk of the people who die are poor. It's only in the affluent countries like this one where we can speak about elderly dying. The dying trajectory. Now, this is one of the trickier ones um, to understand. Despite the fact that in most hunter-gatherer societies, people died very suddenly, their dying was very long. 
And the reason why it was very long is because dying was seen as not necessarily the point where you realized you would die soon and when you actually died, which is the way we think of dying now, when the doctor gives you six months to live, you think, right, I'm starting to die, until death, that, that period where you might call yourself dying. That's not how most hunter-gatherer societies, even today, think about dying. Dying was when you realized that you would die, but it's your identity, not your body. Your identity, not your body. So what happens is that you're walking along and a rock falls on you and you become dead. And all your friends and relatives go up to the rock with you under it and say, hmm, I think he's dying. And they're serious. What they mean is that from this point on, you will begin a journey that will take roughly 12 months before you will really die. Um, and during that 12 months or six months, you'll go on a journey. And I have an, an example here from um, Fijian society in the last 100 years. In Fiji, the journey and its ordeals are, are numerous. After death, a soul comes upon a certain pandanus tree at which he must throw a whale's tooth. If he misses, it means that his wives are not being strangled to join him. If he hits the tree, then his wives will follow along the spirit path. Bachelor souls will encounter a great woman ghost monster who will attempt to devour all bachelors who pass her way. Yeah, some things never change. <laughs> but even if a soul were to survive that ordeal, a goblin waits further on the path, perched on a rock near a ghost beach. Few souls survive this encounter and experience the second death, the real death of the person, okay? But if the dying man should still survive these ordeals, he then reaches a precipice where a boat waits for him. Looking over the precipice, a god or a deputy god asks him about his life. He will then be asked to sit on an oar. This rather unsurprisingly could be a trick. If you sit at the paddle end, the god will tip you over the precipice so that you descend to a rather second-rate heaven. At this second-rate heaven, you may endure further ordeals depending on what you've done or not done in your life, and the punishments differ for men and women. Those who are favoured by the gods at the precipice go to the real Elysium, which is very similar to the Western spiritualist idea of the eternal summerland. Clear skies, warmth, good food, and company, bliss beyond words like dying and going to Miami. <laughs> so you can see that every hunter-gatherer culture has similar stories to this. The actual dying, sometimes the anthropologists call it ancestralization, happens, the dying begins at death, and the real snuff out, if you like, occurs somewhere along the six, 12 months journey. And all cultures, what they try to do to support the dying person is put things in the grave that the dying person can use, even rifles, spears, food. And of course, the Chinese have a, a very old culture um, where you can burn things to centered spirit world to, to help with um, the, the dying person. So if you go to Chinatown, you go to the dead shop, you can get paper houses and stereo systems and television sets, and you burn them, and they send them on to grandma, grandpa in case they get bored, they can switch on the TV. So you can imagine that the dying person in that sense receives things from the living. Now today the dying person gives things to the survivors, but actually originally it was the other way around, that survivors gave things to the dying person. In pre-industrial period, we started to be able to realise when death might come. So we, for, the, for the first time in agricultural societies, we realised that maybe in the next day or in the next few days or the next week, we might actually die. So death started to be reversed out of the other world and to this world. So, for example, it was very common for people to see um, um, their dead just before they died, or they might have seen an angel or the face of God. These were evidence that indeed they were dying. This was not just being sick. That was evidence because the other world was beginning to interact with this world. So dying became short, which is common with infectious diseases. You know, normally the plague, for example, you would die within seven to 10 days. So you'd have a fair while to anticipate what was going on. Today, of course, dying takes a long time. 
If you're being diagnosed with cancer or cardiac failure, you may, in fact, be dying for two or three years with a short life expectancy. It's not uncommon for people to be diagnosed with a terminal condition that they know will kill them, like HIV, for example. Before HIV, before the antivirals, the life expectancy of somebody who was seropositive was about three years. With uh, antivirals, it's now about 10 years, but there, you will die. So dying is a very long-term thing for people. Now, I don't want you to think that people go around thinking they're dying all the time. Dying is part of an identity you get. If your doctor says to you, we can't cure this, your life expectancy might be two or three years, you do start to think of yourself as a dying person, but only partly, in the same way that you think of yourself, for example, as a mother. You don't think of yourself as a mother all the time. You only think of yourself as a mother in relation to your children. If you thought you were a mother all the time, um, I can tell you for one thing, you'd probably be behaving inappropriately at work, for example. So it's the same with dying. Dying is something that becomes part of your identity when you have a serious prognosis. The death scene. In prehistory, of course, when you died or suddenly became dead, because hunter-gatherers worked in small groups of 30 to 50 people, often there were groups around you when you were... Um, when you died. In pre-industrial periods, uh, particularly um, in the Middle Ages, there were often crowds. R remember that before TV and reality TV in particular, there wasn't much entertainment. And one of the interesting things about dying is that you gravitated to people in the village who you knew were dying. For one thing, they were the people most closest to God. So if God was going to say something to you, might say it through the dying person. So it was really worth listening. Maybe you'd capture some words of wisdom that the dying person might say. And so consequently, crowds would always gather uh, around people who, who knew they were dying. In industrial periods, particularly in the last century, dying has become a rather isolated affair, largely as we have shifted dying from home, village, into institutions like hospitals. And um, therefore, there was a period in the 50s and 60s in this country where dying was a rather shameful affair. and People would uh, die in beds alone and in a special uh, room off the side of a ward. And even now, when there are friends and family, as a comment on how isolated the family has become, dying is something that is usually only shared with close family and some professionals. So it's a fairly isolated experience in, in uh, historical terms. Same with exposure. Today, exposure is uncommon. I still come across people in their 50s who have not seen a dead body or have not sat with somebody who has died. It's still pretty common. But for most of human history, that's not the case. For most of human history and in most cultures, by the time you were 16, you would have seen several deaths. Usually, one of your parents and always one of your brothers and sisters by the time you would have reached that age. That's very uncommon today. Preparations. Well, preparations for death have traditionally been religious preparations. Now, for obvious reasons. The other world journey, which is the dying that most hunter-gatherers experience, and which we uh, uh, considered the most important uh, right up till 10 to 12,000 years ago, was really a religious journey. It was an encounter with gods and with demons and with all sorts of animals. And this is why grave goods became terribly important. Uh, in most hunter-gatherer societies. In pre-industrial times, again, because it was agrarian societies, a lot of farming communities, the priest was very, very important to what was going on and helped regulate the seasons and the plantings and the households. So preparing for death was also primarily about the fate of the soul. Death and dying was primarily about the fate of the soul and what you could do to improve its chances of either becoming an ancestor or a god or being saved, depending on your religious persuasion. Now, today, most of the preparations that people make in countries like Canada, the United States, Australia, and even Japan are material preparations, which is another way of saying preparing to make a will, making financial preparations, like having your superannuation in order, and even among the working class, it's common for working class people to have an emergency bank account for if your daughter becomes pregnant when 
before she should or if there's an early death in the family, this kind of thing. It's not to say that religious preparations are not important. They are still important, and particularly in places like the United States, where a sizable amount of religious preparation still goes on, praying, working with clergy, um, those kinds of things. These things are still important, but they have been eclipsed, even in this country, by these particular concerns, material preparations. Also donating your body to science, for example, using parts of your body for organ donation, and this kind of thing. Those kinds of concerns have well and truly eclipsed, but not surpassed, religious preparations. Relationship context. This is very, very important too. In prehistory and in pre-industrial times, in other words, for most human cultures, most human cultures and throughout most of human history, relationships were not based as they are today on sentiment. They are based on duty. So in most cultures, you married somebody that your village had already sorted out for you. You got a wife or a husband when you were a child and the ceremony became simply officiated on that. Gender roles were highly defined. So a wife knew what to do as a wife. Being a wife was like being a bus driver. You knew exactly what your role was. And being a husband was like a bus driver. You knew exactly what you had to do and what you didn't have to do. These things were traditionally prescribed. Today, it's not like that. With major urbanization, work migration, a whole range of issues, now we do not, we are not born and raised in the same place. We do not have our wives and husbands sorted out for us. We go and we have to mix, usually in cities, and we pick our spouses among strangers. This is a totally unprecedented thing. And the only way we can pick a stranger for a husband or wife is by commodifying, which is another way of saying, well, here you are, you meet a stranger, what potential has that stranger to be, my wife or my husband? Well, first thing is looks. Will they look good from my point of view? Do they have a good sense of humour? Are they articulate? Do they have hobbies like mine or very different from mine? Do they come from a similar cultural or ethnic background? These are the things that we look for now because we've got nothing else. We don't know that person. We have to get to know that person. So personality or character becomes the thing which we sell to each other. And after that, we fall in love. That's supposed to be how it works. So what this means at death and dying is that if I'm a dying person and I say to my wife in traditional societies, the horse should go to Bob and the riding boots should go to Bill, my wife would make sure that the horse went to Bob and the riding boots went to Bill. Now today, when I'm dying and I say to my wife, the horse should go to Bob and the riding boots should go to Bill, my loving wife will say, of course, dear, of course. Then I die, and she says, why should Bill get the boots? <laughs> the hell? I never liked that guy. I'm keeping the boots. <laughs> Lest you think I'm joking, this has been going on for hundreds of years and is the key reason for legal intervention in marriages. Now, this is a big idea, but just at the point in history where love becomes the most important quality in relationships, that's at the same point in history when trust deserts us. Mourning. Mourning has always been very public, and um, primarily because privacy was not one of those things that is a feature of traditional societies, hunter-gatherer or peasant societies. Today, of course, uh, in industrial societies, privacy is important. Uh, and that's largely because you have to remember that at the turn of the 20th century, right, we're talking about 1880s and 1890s, 1910, less than 20% of American households had water plumbed into their houses. Most of Europe lived in one or two rooms. One or two rooms. 
now with gentrification, with a rising affluence in the West, with industrialization, we build houses where everyone has their own room. And in fact, we've even got a room for the toilet. And sometimes there's several toilets and they all get their own little rooms. They're like dogs and cats. In the old days, of course, you ha you, you would, it would be normal for you to see your parents and your brothers and sisters having sex and defecating and urinating in the same house. There was no way you could hide from this. People were born in public and they died in public. Now that's not the case. Now you see your little sister go into her room and she comes out completely different. God knows what goes on in there. You don't know what goes on in there. Magic. Magic. Privacy has become extraordinarily important, and so this has also introduced privacy as a huge dimension in the dying experience as well, and in the mourning experience and grieving. The diagnosis. The diagnosis, who is dying? Who decides when you are dying? Well, obviously when a big rock falls on top of your friend, um, the, you consider, you make the diagnosis. We think he's dying. He hasn't moved for days, and he's, he's changing colour. We think he's dying. But in the pre-industrial period, when people was, had a few days, maybe a week, to realise they were dying, it was incumbent upon people to make their own diagnosis. You were considered ignorant. Even in the United States in the 19th century, you were considered ignorant if you could not tell the difference between being very sick and you would recover, and being very sick and you would die. You would have witnessed enough death and dying to see the signs. You would have witnessed a, enough death and dying. You would have understood bodily fluids in a way that you, as contemporary people, could not even conceive of. So it was incumbent upon you to understand that you were dying. Today, you can't make that diagnosis. Today, there's no way in the world you can make that diagnosis. You need a diagnosis from somebody in authority, a doctor or something. If I'm down at that lovely marketplace down there, the river market, I'm drinking a cup of coffee and you come up to me and you say to me, Al, how are you today? And I say, well, you know, not good. I'm dying. You would sit down. You would sit down beside me and say, how did this happen? And I would say, well, I was um, watching TV last week and I was watching an episode of CSI and uh, during the ads, I realised I was dying. And at that point, you would be saying, I've got to go, Al. Look, <laughs> I'll catch you next week, eh? You take good care of yourself. Now, if we wind that back, and I say, and I'm sitting in that lovely river marketplace, and you come along and you say, hey, Al, how are you going? And I say, well, you know, I'm not that good, you know. I'm, I'm dying. And then you're very kind, and you sit down, and you say, well, what, what's happened? Tell, what's happened? Well, I would say, well, about three months ago, I was in the shower, and I was washing away there, and I found a lump. Very good. So then I decided to go to my GP. Very good. And the GP sent me to a specialist to get tests. Very good credibility. Monitors going up here. The tests came back, and it turns out that I have cancer, good word. And then that cancer, that's not the bad news. The bad news is that I have secondaries in the spine, the liver, and the brain. And you're thinking, he's dying. <laughs> I've got my elephant stamp. I have officially become dying. That's the only way you can become dying in this country. Everybody else is just sick. And that's why all the people in nursing homes are not in hospices. They're just in nursing homes. They're not dying, but they are. But the way that we manufacture dying today is that it must go through a credible storyline. And that storyline is highly institutional and highly medicalized and professionalized. That's how we process dying today. And it's very, very different to the way we've done it historically. Place of death. Well, obviously, in hunter-gatherer societies, we died where we stood. In pre-industrial times, when we had residences, we tended to die at home. And today, dying has become institutionalized. Sharon Kaufman, who's uh, an American anthropologist on the West Coast, wrote a book, uh, And a Time to Die, How, America, how uh, 
American hospitals shape dying. I recommend it to you, uh, published by the University of Chicago Press, a very, very good book that shows how hospitals actually shape dying in American society today. But that's a signature book to tell you that now most of us die in nursing homes, hospitals, and hospices. And unless we're officially dying, unless we officially get that rubber stamp, then people will jump on you physically, literally, to keep you alive for as long as possible. We are at the hands of extraordinary medical rescue attempts that are peppered with the sentimentality of life and the lack of a recognition of the naturalness of end of life. And these are huge policy uh, conundrums, not just for the United States, but for all affluent countries. This issue of who gets the elephant stamp is a vital and major crisis that we are all having to deal with in the next 10, 20 years. And finally, the locus of control. Most of the time, for most of human history, it has been the community who has had control over dying. And during the agricultural period, the last 12,000 years, that control has been shared with community and self. So dying people had a certain amount of control over their dying, who they would see and who they would not see, what kinds of uh, rituals they would uh, expose themselves to, what kinds they would not. And the community also shared that control. Now today, a lot of control over dying has been um, delegated to staff. That's not just hospital staff, but also um, legal guardians as well. So we have a situation here, not just in cancer. Remember that the bulk of people who die every year do not die of cancer. They die of frailty or organ failure, dementia, cardiac failure, kidney failure, liver failure, those kinds of things. These are the major causes of death. Dementia is an increasing problem for people. So we have a situation where dying people are more and more losing control and where that control is more and more invested in institutions in the United States and other countries as well of affluence. What are some of the sociological factors for change? Obviously, the major reason why we have shifted from traditional hunter-gatherer societies to agricultural ones to contemporary ones has been not medicine, but public health changes. We have stopped standing in our own sewerage. So sanitation, clean water, better housing. These things have done more for us in life expectancy terms than the development of the medical profession, which has really only stopped killing us around the late 19th century. Other than that, medicine was a contributing factor to, to killing us. It was, in fact, the bourgeoisie in Europe who would keep the doctors away because they would like to stick a leech into you, thus hastening, um, not postponing your death. But after World War II, doctors have become extremely useful to us. Um, interpersonal changes, there's been the ascent of privacy, which has been a bourgeois, a very middle class kind of uh, value. There's been a growth of single income families, which has increased the, um, the, uh, the accent on privacy. There's been an ascent of sentiment, I've already said about this business, about falling in love, as opposed to the, the uh, obligations of being a man and a woman. In traditional societies, if you're a certain age, you acted a certain age. If you're a man, you acted a man. If you're a woman, you acted a woman. If you were black, you acted black. Now, all of that has shifted in the last even 30 to 50 years. Now everything is negotiated face to face. You do not know what you're dealing with. Um, it's become a highly difficult and anxiety-ridden culture that we live in now. So sentiments been become terribly important in terms of who's attracted to who. There's also been a waning of religious influence. That I put there rather glibly, but it's in fact a contentious issue. Are people in fact getting less religious? Or is, or is the idea of religiosity now diversifying into broader traditions of spirituality, for example? Just because you don't go to church or see a minister does not necessarily mean you're not religious anymore. So this is a kind of a, a contentious and, and ambiguous area. There's been a major gentrification as well. We've become more and more middle class. Affluence makes us more and more like each other than ever before. And there's a spread of middle class polity, values of speaking well, being positive, being polite. You know, it's still 
not the case that if you come to my place for dinner, that you know, I will just say to you, how many of you masturbated today? Th that still doesn't go down well. <laughs> You get the idea. And there's been a, a, rise, in, a rise in professionalization as well. Um, once upon a time, there were very few professions. The shaman in the village, and shamans particularly in South America, could be up to half the population. But shamans have been a very traditional um, uh, role, and the, they're a kind of healthcare person and a, and a teacher and a religious uh, leader as well. But today, we've split all of those things up, and we have the doctor, the lawyer, and the funeral. Nobody does their own plumbing anymore. Nobody does their own electrics anymore. Nobody does their own self-education anymore. Most of this, we've become specialised, and we buy what we need from the other specialists. And so that's why death has become the way it has as well. And there have been economic changes as well. There's now a primacy of consumption over production. Used to be you knew where you were as a person from your relationship to the means of production, which is another way of saying, well, I'm a coal miner. And you could always tell a coal miner by the way they dressed. And you could always tell a, ship's, a shipmate, if you like, by the way they dressed and the way they spoke. But now that's not the case. You can't tell from what people look like anymore who they are. You know, this person dresses like this, they must be a doctor or a lawyer. No, they might be the local plumber. They might be the local coal miner. You can't tell because of affluence People now buy all the things that they can buy. It used to be like in the, when I was a university professor, maybe in the 30s, I could treat all my students like rubbish. It wouldn't matter. <laughs> now if I treat all my students like rubbish, the vice chancellors or the president's lover could be in the room. <laughs> I could have the shortest academic career in the United States. There's no way you can tell who people are anymore. <laughs> so there's a primacy of consumption and product over production. Class is not something that wears itself on the surface anymore. OK, here are some references. As I said, we've skipped over two million years. We've crossed all the different cultures. And you might think, well, there's lots of little exceptions in your head. Well, you can read more about it here. Basically, what I want to say to you in today's lecture and what you will find in this book is that the elephant stamp issue has become a major critical issue. Although we don't like to think about death and dying, cultures in the past and all cultures across the human family have found it helpful to recognise when dying begins. They've been able to increase intimacy, they've been able to share and they've been able to recognise the beginning of a long and often mysterious journey. And we're losing that. And some say we've lost it. The only people who can get to be called dying these days go into hospice. And the bulk of us are not sure. We're just sort of getting older and older. and Like Lord of the Rings, we're like the elves. We sort of fade to the west. But we don't fade to the west. And if you think you are going to fade to the west, you're making a big mistake. You will die. And it will come a necessary time to recognise that. It's an important part of the enrichment of not only yourself as an identity, but your families and your friends. And we've lost that art. And that's a very serious thing. Thank you very much. Keep, keep you up there and I'll... Just... Oh, OK. okay. We have time for questions. We're passing around two mics, so if you would raise your hand, we will pass you a mic. Start with uh, Faisal back there. Um, hello. Um, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, my name is Faisal. I'm studying here at the Clinton School. I'm from Indonesia. Um, I happen to, um, uh, to take the course ab about uh, American health policy. And uh, we learn how um, the uh, the cost for the elderly people to take care of the elder elderly people and 
end of life cost, it is so high. And um, <clears throat> I'm not talking about <laughs> the, um, not taking care of the elderly, but, um, and also I happened to interview uh, another doctor uh, last week uh, about this. And uh, he got his father passed away uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, we were talking about the life expectancy and so on and so on. Um, now the life expectancy is more than eight years old. So uh, how long you know um, people should live? For example, 100 years old or or, or more. And um, how what what is um, a good way to you know prepare um, people in terms of um, to have a dignified that, for example, so that, you know, uh, when it is the time to go, you know, you will just go and the family will accept it. Is it, um, is it through a religion or, and I've been talking uh, to some doctors who have their parents who, who live really long, and these doctors, when they talk about death, they are really relaxed really relax so should we have um, like uh, education that uh, about medicine for example uh, that if you will reach at this point it is time to go and or I we should prepare a document a legal yeah. document all right or I think I, I get the drift of your question first of all what you have to understand about death and dying is that death and dying today is where healthcare was a hundred years ago it's a bit like asking when should we prepare for a heart attack? Actually, we should prepare for a heart attack all our life. The idea of preparing for a heart attack um, when you wheeling to wheeled into accident and emergency is a nonsense. Right? The idea, you know what you're supposed to do with respect to heart health. You're supposed to eat better. You're supposed to exercise regularly. You know these kinds of things. You're not supposed to uh, uh, listen only to your doctor. If I go into a restaurant and I have battered fish and chips on Monday night, then I go to the restaurant on Tuesday night and I have battered fish and chips, you'll think, boy, Alan likes his battered fish and chips. Then I go on the Wednesday and I have battered fish and chips and people start to get a bit concerned. Then they're thinking, Alan's got a nutrition problem. Then on Thursday I have battered fish and chips and then somebody will say something to me. And it won't be a doctor. It'll be my friends and my family. You have to stop eating the battered fish and chips, Alan. You will kill yourself. That's health promotion. That health promotion has come from my family and friends. That's the new public health movement. The time to prepare for death is all the time. You can die when you're eight. Life expectancy is a delusion. Dying is around the corner, every corner, every day. What we've lost in the last 100 years is that realization that death, like health, is not something you need to take for granted. You must not take it for granted, your health or death. It's something that you need to prepare for all the time. We need to start talking to each other about it all the time. So as that when the topic comes up, we don't panic like we do now. As far as doctors are concerned, doctors are an extremely good person to have around. I would not particularly want a doctor who was relaxed around death and dying around me. About health, about medicine, and uh, you know, oh, um, at this point, I cannot be helped anymore. So there will be less effort on me, like to keep me alive. Yes, I, I would mean, I say think death education. I'm, death education is important for doctors, and medical interventions are important. But what you have to understand is that if you do a time motion study of what professionals do around dying people, they do the least. The most time spent with dying people are around their friends and family. And secondly, the most, Im most painful thing a dying person can experience is not pain in their bones, or nausea, or weight loss. It's being lonely, being vulnerable, left abandoned. These are the social and spiritual issues. They are the most important thing. Because of the emphasis on the medical profession and health policy development, we have put a lot of our effort and concentration around the kind of uh, 
medical management of dying, but this is a delusion. The, the most important aspects of the management of dying are social and psychological and spiritual. The medical management is not unimportant, but its priority is lower than those other things. And they're the things that fall to you and me. And they're the things we do not do as well as we could. And that's where we need to change. Uh, yes, you back there, ma'am. What impact do you think under the three categories that you had, prehistoric, industrial, and all, that suicide, cremation, barrel in the ground, or in tombs will have in the 21st and 22nd century? What impact under capitalism will those three change? Cremation, suicide, and burial in the ground. Well, in Britain we use the word disposal, which takes into account burial in the ground and cremation and so forth. Um, most cultures have religious views uh, about those issues. And there does not seem to be a pattern that fits in those three categories when it comes to disposal issues. So I have not spoken about disposal deliberately. Um, so amongst Australian Aborigines, for example, um, cremation is done by some groups. Uh, aerial burial, putting the dead body in a tree for birds to pick, is another um, habit of some groups of Aborigines. And ground burial is another habit. And these are all hunter-gatherers, so there's a tremendous diversity. And it's the same with the industrial people. There's, there's no rule of thumb. Um, disposal is one of those things that's highly influenced, I think, mainly by religious ideas. Okay. Um, so in Catholic countries, burial in the ground or above ground has been the priority. Amongst Protestants with a different view of the body, cremation has been um, more important. So the majority of people in Britain who are Protestant, for example, cremate. The majority of people in Italy do not, for obvious reasons. As far as suicide is concerned, it has to be said that suicide today is a very loaded term. But most countries, uh, most cultures uh, uh, throughout history have respected suicide. But not meaningless suicide. Suicide with a reason. Okay. Um, there is um, a tendency today to speak about um, assisted suicide and people want euthanasia. Well, that's not any different from suicide, but because we're middle class and we're used to having assistants to take the garbage out or have someone cook for us or, you know, so when you come to die, well, we say, well, can, you, can, you, can you give me a hand, please? <laughs> this is a lifelong habit. All right? Other, other, than, other than that, um, you will find that suicide, again, is a, a, a bit like, not entirely like, but a bit like a disposal in the sense that it's highly influenced by religious ideas. If you were a, raised a Japanese person up until the 20th century, you'll find that suicide is closely connected to altruism. If you, uh, whilst you think about suicide today in America, for example, that has been incredibly influenced by the profession of psychology and psychiatry, you'll find suicide most identified with either mental illness or depression. These are cultural categories. These are not necessarily scientific categories in the way in which we, we uh, think about them in, in first impressions. Now, culture does play a major role. Um, and of course, Christian ideas in particular have been um, fairly anti-suicide. Again, though, not if there is a good reason. So there has always been a room, even in Christian traditions, for altruistic suicide. And, you know, we can, and various Christian religions debate the issue about whether the crucifixion itself was a form of suicide or whether Christ himself could have escaped. So it goes. A lot of theologians debate this. So suicide is one of those things that, uh, and disposal that you've picked up that actually don't fit neatly into those three categories, and that's why I haven't addressed them. Next question. Uh, you, ma'am, right there. Just a quick question to go back to the re religiosity. Do you, can you speak um, perhaps shortly on the difference between the United States and, say, Europe or even the UK and the difference in religious um, approaches between the two countries and how that affects their looking at death and dying? Um, I wasn't quite sure I heard your question. I'm just looking at the difference when you look at Europe. Um, there's a significant difference in belief in God and attendance to church and 
um, more adherence to religious um, uh, instructions versus the United States, a quite religious country by comparison. And I'm wondering how that then influences the differences that you would see in an otherwise fairly equal economic development, industrialized um, societies, but very different in religious beliefs. Yeah. Uh, in the matter of death and dying, just in the matter of death and dying, the American um, uh, tendency to have higher rates, and that's what we're talking about here, higher rates of church attendance, for example, and religious practices, doesn't really seem to have an impact, major impact on most of the indicators around death and dying, except in the matter of preparation, where there are more religious preparations among Americans than there are um, in some other countries. Having said that, they're very high in Ireland and in Italy, for example. But um, at the end of the day, you need to step back. I mean, one of the things that you will see when you look at social history of dying, in this book is you have to understand that although the world is full of people that speak different languages and wear different clothes, the reality is most of them have a lot in common with each other. And Christianity uh, and non-Christians and Christians actually have very similar values because it's the culture that's most important. And in places like uh, Europe and Britain and Australia or Canada or the United States, the debates are really about how closely enmeshed these populations are with institutional religions. And that's where your question is coming from. From my point of view, that question is not as important as whether societies are influenced by historical religions, where this is up and this is down, this is heaven and this is earth, that's a woman and that's a man, opposites never meet. That kind of historical mentality is very characteristic of Buddhism and Islam and Hinduism and Christianity and therefore their practices around death and dying are almost the same. But hunter-gatherers like Australian Aborigines and native North Americans, uh, First Nation people in South America, Kalahari Bushmen, they don't think like that. They don't have an identity that is so split in terms of paradoxes and oppositional elements. The individual is not particularly revered, the group is. Totems are more important than, than individual biography. And we see major changes in the way in which dying people prepare for death and approach um, even close brushes with death compared to, say, Americans or Australians. And when it comes to that kind of religion, there are only three or four major styles, if, if you read the anthropological or archaeological literature. So the, the issue of American enmeshment, if you like, in Christian practices for an anthropologist, it's not a major question because those things don't make a lot of difference to the overall structure of the practice. Yes, they do in terms of the minor detail, but not in the overall shape of how Americans die. Essentially, Americans die like Australians, like British, like Germans, and they don't die like Kalahari Bushmen, and they don't die like Fijians. And that's, that's the most important uh, observation to make there. Time for one more question. You are here, sir. You mentioned that in our current culture, the state and the institutions have a lot to do with it. And we have movements of right to life, and, and we have examples of Terry Schiavo and things. Yeah. Is there a movement to look at it just from a cost-benefit basis of not keeping people who are dead alive? Cost-benefit? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, are, are we coming to a point where we can allow people to die rather than pour a half million dollars into their medical care and keep them for three months more? Mm. Is that movement <laughs> coming about? Is there such a movement? Is that your question? Well, I mean, I don't, I'm, not aware, I'm not aware of a social movement that looks at the cost-benefit of dying generally. But on a case-by-case -case basis, for example, um, a lot of the debates around the determination of death, right, when do you decide somebody is actually dead, which is the brain death debates. These debates are sometimes couched in terms of cost-benefit. If 
a person is declared brain dead. And from the medical profession's point of view, there is no point in keeping them on life support. If you decide that you want to keep them on life support for social reasons, which is the family does not believe they're dead, hmm? that's an extremely costly decision. And if a lot of people decide to do that, we're using high-tech, state-of-the-art to keep a lot of people who some people think is dead, who've made a career studying this, versus the people who have a sentimental attachment to their loved one and who think is not dead. So their cost-benefit arguments are made. And there are no easy ways to deal with. You know, some people say it is cheaper to kill everybody everywhere as soon as they're born. <laughs> and, and the animals are big on that. And the trees are not far behind them. Those of us who think actually we could wear the expense of allowing human beings to continually napalm the planet are of the view that decisions about costs are social decisions and they're about priorities. Who we will decide we'll live in, who we will spend the money on. In Australia, we spend millions and millions and millions, we're a very small country, on um, HIV, HIV prevention, and that's a good thing. But at the end of the day, the dispassionate view of this is that um, 200 Australians die a year nationally of AIDS. And every year I can fill a football stadium of 100,000 seats with people who are grieving. Every year I can fill that stadium. And the budget for those people who live forever in pain it's a fraction that goes into HIV. And what's more cost effective? These are social decisions. We have to decide which were the priorities. We don't have enough money. We don't, it's not like a piece of string. All decisions about who shall live and who shall not are based on our social values. We'll never get away from that. So cost benefit arguments that are based purely on economic issues are dead end. It's like my dear colleague Anthony Giddens, who's Britain's most famous sociologist, once said about psychology. The problem with psychology is that not only is it waiting for the wrong train, but they're waiting on the wrong platform as well. <laughs> and cost-benefit analysis is really beside the point when it comes to human life. It's about social values, the decisions we make and do not make about how we wish to live. 